it stopped working, we wouldn't know how to fix it, sort of? Or if it made us stop working. <laughs> And it is scary, like, because we, we don't know what it means. Like, it, it will create, like, a system of rules internally that do not make sense to us, and they're sure. not really supposed to make sense to us. They're just supposed to kind of give us targeted results, right? One thing I've, I've been really uh, interested in and can be applied uh, to a lot of different places, it's a really kind of a neat trick, is um, deep learning for feature embedding. Hmm. So. The way that works is, when you're doing machine learning, almost all the work you do is figuring out what features to use. And a feature is just an input to your algorithm. So if you're trying to find out whether somebody's going to get cancer or who's going to click on what ad, <laughs> for instance, right? For instance. The main thing is trying to figure out, well, how, how, what information do you need in order to figure that out? How, where can we find that information? What form should it be in? Hmm. Um, so you've got you to gotta get features. Mm -hmm. And so the way that uh, feature embedding works is you get that sort of vector of features, that list of features, by first training a deep neural net. So there's uh, one such project called uh, word to vec mm -hmm. which is um, taking words and then trying to learn on where they occur. So if you have a huge corpus of uh, text, right? You can kind of figure out sort of what a word means and the way that humans kind of learn what words mean is through like seeing them in context a lot of times. If you train a deep neural network based on that, well, okay, now you've, you've sort of trained it to know when to expect to see that word. Mm -hmm. Then what you do is you just basically slice off the last layer. So basically you take the layer of neurons before the last layer that tells you where to expect them mm -hmm. and that's the one that is most differentiating between different words okay and then that's your feature so each of those features in that layer doesn't really mean anything necessarily mm -hmm. um, what you end up with is just a vector where again we don't really have control over the feature set it's not something somebody designed which is normal for machine learning for someone to engineer that feature set Mm -hmm. These features don't really have any meaning per se, mm -hmm. but they end up working really, really well for cool things. Like, for instance, you can take that vector and do vector math on it, and it ends up doing uh, sort of logical operations on the ideas that you've trained it on. Mm -hmm. so, so, for instance, you can do things like take the vector for the word king and subtract the vector for the word queen, and you might get a vector that looks like the vector for the word male hmm. and things of that nature. Interesting. So, yeah. So you, you can do all kinds of weird stuff with it. Yeah. Spooky stuff. And, and it's nice because <laughs> machine, like uh, deep, deep learning is really slow. The training process is really, really slow. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of have that learning process in the background and then you can take the output of it in a very digestible form and then do like normal sorts of machine learning with that like hmm. you can then use that as an input to uh, logistic regression or something like that Interesting. that is much much faster so it's like you're encoding ideas in this kind of amorphous it learns vector. It, yeah it learns a strange new idea encoding <laughs> right yes that you could do math on Exactly, that you can do math, which is <laughs> totally unexpected and really wild. Yeah, and I think you see, you're seeing a lot of people use things like this now. Um, you know, I've seen it in, in several places, but it's, it's kind of just interesting and also very spooky. It has that same <laughs> element where it's like doing these things that kind of make sense to you, but you don't know how it's doing it or why it's doing it based on what it's keeping, what it's doing. Um, right. Yeah, and I think like, you know. But the weird thing is you can, you can slice off that last layer and it still works, Yeah, it's still operable, and that's kind of true all the way through it. So you don't have control, you know, normally in a computer program, all you're doing is, you know, there's transformations happening on data, and you're kind of, you're controlling and, and managing that data every step of the way. You're giving it like variable names. Mm -hmm. Right now, suddenly you've got a ton of variables and they have no names. Yeah. But they actually, they, they depending on how well your, your algorithm is working, um, they may have meaning. Yeah. It's just you don't know what that meaning is. They have, they have some kind of relationship embedded in them. Right. So they understand what this one unnamed variable is with respect to these other variables. Right? And, and the layers of the network are kind of like layers of abstraction. Yeah. 
And, and what's interesting about this, and I guess about just evolution in the mind in general, is that you kind of see this pattern where it's like, not necessarily like the lowest level, like the, I should say like, you know, the named version of these things that matters. It's more about like the relationship that you build between these concepts. And if you look at like how the mind works, right? So if you look at um, some of, like Kurzweil has a book, Creating Human Mind, so I've been reading that recently, mm -hmm. um, where he actually looks at the brain and he'll actually um, try to figure out exactly what makes our learning components in the brain tick just by looking at like the physical structure of how it's connected and how like the top layer of the neocortex is connected to like a lower set of like pattern recognizers that are kind of nested and feed into each other and create this kind of hierarchical pattern of inputs that we're effectively like trying to model with some of this machine learning. Like when we talk about neurons that we're modeling, right? right. It kind of is based on the idea of, of like the brain. Um, mm -hmm. And if you think about the brain, like it's kind of building up these levels of abstraction at different layers. And that's kind of what we're representing, I think, in these, in these deeper layers of, yeah. a, of a network is like abstraction, right? Mm -hmm. And what we think of as abstraction when we think of intelligence abstract ideas um, but it's really weird to think that you know inside your brain when you're thinking of like like uh, you know you think of a particular person versus thinking about the idea of a person mm. that that's that's uh, that operation is being carried out by just like different layers of goop <laughs> that are inside your skull like this yeah. one layer of goop it deals with people, <laughs> and this one below it can deal with individual people. Or the concept of man. <laughs> right. That doesn't, yeah. that doesn't, make, it's, it, that that doesn't make you feel comfortable. But it's what's happening. Like, everything that we know about And people, I think concepts. a lot of people would have criticisms of that and say, well, you're kind of massively oversimplifying it. Hmm. But, or that, you know, we really don't understand how the brain works at all. Hmm. And that, you know, there's some deep mystery there. Mm -hmm. Or they may latch on to um, some of the sort of traditional ideas about sort of ab abstraction being somehow metaphysical, like it's not really encodable. Like or not of this world. Sure, or like of consciousness, or mm -hmm. I guess, you know, there's, there's you, you don't have to look very far to find somebody who would be a naysayer. Like definitely most of these, these ideas, if you just presented this to them to someone the first time, Mm. Almost certainly everyone's going to reject them and say, you know, I don't get the sense that that's how I work. Yeah. And but some do. It sounds very, very simple. <laughs> in which and it is kind of an, like this description is even like an oversimplification of how neural networks work, obviously. Yeah. But the question is, how complex does it need to be before it starts working well at mm. doing the stuff that we every, every day do inside our own minds? Uh, and that's an open thinking. question. Right. Yeah. Right when and like I think what they're trying to say now with all these findings is not not that complex. Well, I mean at the like because if you look at the brain itself at how complex it is now, it's good enough to play Go. Right, <laughs> which is a hard game. Right, uh, and there are some arguments that say the brain is actually not that complex. Like it, it is complicated the result of what's happening, but if you look at like cellular autonomous systems, the rules are simple, but the pattern is complex, and I think the brain is is an example of that. Right. Not necessarily that the brain is as simple as cellular automata, but if you look at the neocortex, you do see that it is a consistent pattern of like it's these very very things. much repeated and homogenous. Homogenous consistency. So it's not really so much complex. It's not a very complicated mechanism so much as it is just a very large mechanism. Right. And we're talking about like well, is is some trying to figure out like when machines are really going to have sort of parity with humans. And like, when can we expect that? Three months. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> we haven't really reproduced the brains. This is another cool like thought experiment that I've been having. So 3D printers, our last topic, right? Super interesting, by the way. You should go check them out. Uh, but you know, you think about like cellular printing. So mm -hmm. people are printing like bladders now, right? Um, they're printing lungs, they're printing ears. So they're printing like biological material to a certain extent. Now, if you think about, like, if we carry that out into the long term, uh, you, could, you could start to c consider printing... Neurons. Neurons. Right. Yeah. Stem cells that could become brain cells. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, could, we can get to that point where we're making closer and closer approximations to an actual physical brain 
that we would operate with. And maybe you could use it to replace like parts of our brain for brain injury patients. Well, what if you just, yeah, you could. That's, the, that's one of the interesting things is that interfaces with the optical nerve, for instance, for blind people could be created. You know, you could have a machine learn some of the things that have kind of been lost in someone who's, who's had uh, damage of one kind or another. And sort of the, like the senses and the extremities of the neural, uh, the central nervous system are kind of the easy ways to get in there and start doing that sort of thing mm. and are really, really cool. Yeah. Um, so it is possible, like, we do see it, right? I kind of wonder what would happen if you just like, if you just printed a neocortex. Yes. Exactly, specifically in your I mean, it wouldn't right? really have uh, probably emotion, right? Because that's mostly handled by other parts of the brain. And couldn't you just like print a really, really big one? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's homogenous. Because it's homogenous. Yeah. And then you'd end up with like a terrifying mother brain that would kill everyone. Potentially, yeah. <laughs> no, maybe not. Maybe not kill it. <laughs> I'm trying to picture it in my head, and I'm imagining it being like uh, the ramen that comes in the rectangular packages, <laughs> just kind of like wavy. It's like a brain. And it just keep going forever. It'd just be like a massive ramen. That <laughs> yeah, I don't want to deal with that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be nasty. First off. Yeah. No, but like, I don't know. I, I I worry about that, and so we could also take very high resolution scans of people's brains right that's another thing so when you start to like combine our creation technology with our like measurement technology and our analysis technology then you could actually kind of probably eventually create something that looks a lot like and works a lot like a human brain um, that already existed that's a copy of somebody else's brain so our ability to scan brains um, is interesting I mean at this point it's basically I think flatworms I think that's the most complex brain it's not even really a brain it's like a big it's like a big ganglion there's not much there's not that many neurons in a flatworm that's true um, and that's I think one of the one of the other areas where I think a lot of uh, well-respected uh, people in, in neuroscience say well there's these big barriers to certain kinds of scanning and you know that just means it's gonna take us a lot longer to really get there and you know don't get too excited about you know uploading oh. yourself into a computer <laughs> because we're really kind of a, a long way away mm -hmm. there's definitely a whole lot more to be uh, developed within uh, within computer science, within computer hardware, that's going to do a whole bunch of intelligent things that we didn't think computers would uh, do so soon. I think we're going to continue be, to be surprised by things like AlphaGo yeah. uh, a long time before anyone like sits down and gets a full brain scan. I think that's actually a lot farther insane. away than um, like you know sitting down and having a chat with a computer. I think that's going to happen a lot sooner. That's probably true. And I guess the, the idea of like being able to fabricate brains is more on just kind of conveying the message that, you know, brains probably are not as complex of a thing as you might imagine. Like the thing that is happening in a brain could be modeled effectively by definitely other things. Definitely effectively necessary. enough to do your job, <laughs> right? Maybe not effectively enough to be you. I don't know, that's a bit of a... And that becomes more of a philosophical question. Yeah. Like, what does it mean? To, how, how well do you need to be simulated in order to be the real deal? Yeah. Right? What does that mean? That's true. And when you put my intelligence into things, then what happens to that thing? Are they you? Mm -hmm.